um, I'm going to talk about something different. So, uh, yes, well, the gravitational capture is composed of this by Kerr super and Okay. So, uh, why do we, uh, or maybe not, uh, do something about the tool? Or No, uh, not. No. Yeah. What was it? What was it talking about? Oh, come on. Yeah. Ah, you don't kill me. You don't kill me. Please kill. Well, I can kill him. Okay. So, uh, hello. <laughs> My name is Pau. Um, so, why do we care about these things in the first place, right? So uh, uh, I'm talking. I'm not talking about the uh, gravitational capture of uh, two uh, compact objects with about the same mass. I'm talking about the capture of a compact object by a very massive uh, uh, black hole. So this is interesting. Why is this interesting? Um, so uh, I'm not going to play the usual movie, although I like it a lot. But uh, uh, so this is uh, the uh, slow. If you want uh, a diabatic in spiral of a compact object into a supermassive black hole. So you have a binary supermassive black hole, a compact object. This is flying through periapsis. We have emission of rotational waves all along the orbit. But around the center, you have a very strong burst of rotational radiation. You have a binary. You lose energy. Then you shrink the symmetry axis a little bit. You repeat the operation. Uh, something like a thousand, if not into the four, five times. And uh, eventually, the compact object will fall into the uh, supermassive black hole. Or will go well, anyway. So, uh, for a uh, space-borne uh, uh, observatory like uh, LISA, we are looking at uh, black holes with masses between 24 and 26. Uh, it is uh, very nice that uh, this range of uh, masses corresponds uh, to galactic nuclei, which are actually relaxed so that uh, we expect to have uh, an old uh, segregated uh, population of compact objects very close to the supermassive black hole. And uh, by the way, I don't think that anybody came to the idea of doing this calculation before thinking of Lisa, but uh, it's a very nice uh, uh, coincidence. So uh, in principle, we can reach a relative of uh, one, if not a uh, uh, little bit uh, further away. And uh, so this is interesting. So this MRIS, uh, this is an extreme Extreme mass, 26, 10 solar masses, ratio in spiral. So uh, there has not been any other mission ever conceived, planned, or even thought of uh, that can deliver the kind of science that we can do with these things. So this is why uh, these things are so unique. So general relativity is a theory, and uh, you have uh, to check that theory. And uh, Thanks to these uh, 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 probes, we can uh, we can probe uh, gravity in the strong regime. So you can test uh, alternative theories of gravity because you have a geodesic and geo in quotation marks because it refers to Earth. We're talking about uh, black holes here, mapping of the space and time. It's like uh, having a flying camera, taking pictures of the space and time around supermassive black holes. So you can test uh, alternative theories. And uh, you measure uh, parameters, the resistive parameters, with a very, very <coughs> high precision. So this is the range of masses that uh, we're looking at. So this is the characteristic amplitude, uh, something like uh, the amplitude of the wave. 
anti this frequency. This is uh, the usual uh, sensitivity curve for LISA for a 10 to the 7 here supernatural black hole and a compact optic of 10 solar masses, the three first harmonics in uh, the Peters approximation, 10 to the 7, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 5. So this is kind of masses that we're looking at. And uh, we're talking about a binary. So you have a centimeter axis and an eccentricity here. Um, this uh, looks like a very complicated plot, but it is not. This is the last uh, stable orbit so that uh, anything to the left of that uh, curve that we can see. Uh, and on the right, we have uh, two different regimes. We have the regime in which, uh, in a kind of uh, random walk-like uh, fashion, a star, a compact object, is uh, uh, you know, trying to move uh, all the way in that direction towards uh, uh, higher Earth. So this kind of, uh, this one minus two eccentricity until it crosses this red line. And that red line is giving the threshold between the dynamic dominated regime and the regime in which uh, the binary evolved only because of the emission of reflection radiation. Which is why after crossing it, it looks like this. It's following one of these uh, lines down to the Lisa band. Now, um, there's a problem. So uh, the way at uh, looking, so the motivation here was to uh, try to derive the gen rate for those kind of uh, things. And uh, a couple of decades ago, uh, people started to look uh, into this problem by looking at free relaxation, of course, because uh, we know how it works. But there is a problem, and the problem is that uh, um, if uh, you are very far away from uh, the supernatural black hole. And uh, you start uh, typically when one of these orbits with a very high eccentricity of that order, this is the typical eccentricity that you have initially, any, you have a, a very a very radial orbit and uh, any perturbation at upper center could uh, either produce one of these two situations. You could either scatter away the interesting object from your orbit so that uh, it's lost or you could set it in such on, on such a very high um, eccentricity orbit so that it would be almost completely radial and that would be basically a head-on collision with a supernatural black hole. So you get probably one or two intense bursts of reflection radiations but you don't get uh, a thousand or a hundred thousand uh, of them from a coherent source which is what you want, right? So. Uh, Traditionally, we have been calling these things plunges, which is a very uh, bad thing because it's very confusing. So uh, these plunges traditionally are so uh, like a head-on collisions whoop, with a super black hole. They are not interesting. These are bursting uh, sources, and uh, you cannot do much with these sources. Like a one <laughs> of the like uh, that uh, you get with uh, LIGO. So uh, well, you get a detection, but uh, uh, anyway. <coughs> um, so. Uh, the fix for that would be to get closer and closer to the simplest black hole because you have uh, less and less perturbers. But then you have a problem. If you get uh, closer and closer to the simplest black hole, the cell intensity also decreases and uh, the uh, associated time scale increases a lot, relaxation, right? So it would take uh, forever actually to see something interesting. Relaxation time scale increases a lot because uh, uh, the number density uh, decreases. But in any case, at that point, uh, resonant relaxation seems uh, to be the solution to the problem. You are not talking about a chaotic process, you're talking about a, a secular process uh, like uh, what uh, Anne Marie described. But uh, there seemed to be a problem because uh, resonant relaxation was producing sources that are much uh, higher uh, uh, um, pace than uh, free body relaxation, which uh, was solving or fixing the problem. But uh, when you consider general relativity, then you have a problem because uh, uh, there was this uh, paper by uh, David Merritt uh, et al. Actually, in 2010, uh, he... Um, presented this in one of these uh, Social Meetings in Paris, 
And uh, you have, uh, I don't know whether you have seen that, fl that plot, but uh, there is a kind of blockade in angular momentum so that uh, uh, the uh, stars trying to get into an interesting orbit cannot achieve uh, the kind of eccentricities that you need uh, to become an extreme massive spiral, which is why they used to call it, uh, or they call it the fragile barrier, or more recently, the adiabatic uh, invariant uh, barrier. But uh, anyway, I don't know whether Ben is going to talk about this, but uh, but uh, in any case, it's an ongoing debate about uh, its very nature and implications, and uh, yes, in particular, these papers are relevant. <coughs> so you have that problem. So uh, you have uh, you have your stellar system. You have uh, a cusp because we have a cusp, and uh, you can produce a lot of interesting sources from that area. But the problem is that those sources will either plunge readily, whoop, or you lose them completely. So you have to get closer, but by, by getting closer, you run into the problem of uh, having a kind of blockade in angular momentum. So it seems like uh, the event rate for extreme massive spirals would drop a lot, and uh, well, we would basically not uh, see this thing. Now, but uh, what if t by relaxation actually uh, this uh, stream attraction spirals produced uh, by a uh, two-body relaxation did not uh, plant readily. Well, that would be very nice because uh, they are created at the bulk of the uh, stellar system where you have many, many, many sources and, uh, and uh, they, uh, they would have to also all the interesting properties that I would, uh, that I will uh, <coughs> discuss later. So, uh, and this is where it comes, the spin of the black hole. So, uh, Actually, quite a few years ago, four years ago, we asked the following uh, question. So what is the number of, uh, can you actually um, make a compact object plunge into a supermassive black hole with this spinning? Even if you start with an extremely eccentric initial orbit. It turns out that, uh, uh, Nobody had uh, looked into that, but it's uh, relatively easy to estimate. Um, you have to take the uh, initial orbital parameters, evolve them, and uh, find the parameters that uh, come out of that. So you have to calculate uh, this uh, similar interaction, centricity and inclination, calculate the constant of motion and the average flux of these constants so that the you have something like the average uh, time evolution. And calculate the time from upper center to peri center by looking at instantaneous geodesic geodesics and uh, get the change in energy, angular momentum, and uh, the Cartier constant, and get the new uh, um, orbital element. And uh, by doing this exercise, we found out that actually, even if you start with something extremely radial, something looking like uh, almost a straight line, you do not uh, plunge into the supermassive black hole. Radial. Exactly radial, but you will plan. Yes, sir. This is the time. So you have uh, four different masses of the central supermassive black hole, different spins, quite high spin, but also rather uh, mild spin, and uh, very high eccentricities, initial eccentricities. You don't get a one or a few very absolute positive, but uh, quite a few of them. Uh, huh? How many lines? How, How many lines? How many beta orbitals? The question is the point of the question. Yes, but this is the kind of uh, standard uh, eccentricity that you get uh, for two body uh, relaxation extreme attraction spirals when you form them. Okay. So in this context, it would be more extreme attraction spirals. Yes. But uh, and the, and the uh, uh, a way of uh, illustrating why this is so is by looking at the last stable orbit. Off center. Yeah, if you don't, I mean, if you actually see the other orbit, if you don't, I, I mean, yes, if you if you are starting at infinity with a radial orbit, of course, gravity might also steer the the, the, the waves and the, and plunge them. But if you 
Okay, maybe that's the, the what uh, we did was to take at a certain distance Planck orbit and evolve them by making the assumption that uh, the central object is not a Schwarzschild black hole but a curved black hole and see what happened. And that's what happened. But the net, the net effect of Turner, the net effect of the spin of the black hole is just the exertion, not only of the side wall in space or of the distance or of the orbit. So if you aim a little bit to the side, you have the you have exactly the same yeah. region. But it depends on the size. Well, one way of looking at that is uh, this. So uh, this is, uh, again, the same thing. It's a plot in phase space, so signal interactions eccentricity, and that's the last stable orbit for a Schwarzschild black hole. And uh, you have here a family of uh, different uh, separatrices for uh, a spin of uh, 0.1 and also different inclinations. If you increase the spin, uh, there is a spread. So it's 0.4, 0.7, 0.99. Again, the thick line corresponds to Schwarzschild. The family of uh, separatrices below the, the curve correspond to prograde orbit. And uh, the family of uh, separatrices on the top of the curve to retrograde orbit. Now, this is uh, and, uh, an even more extreme case. Uh, the situation is uh, it's not symmetric. Well, this is general relativity. It's not, uh, it's not uh, uh, very intuitive. but. Uh, it's not uh, symmetric, so that they, they contributions do not cancel out. But uh, one way of looking at this is that uh, if you are a star and you are traveling towards a supernova black hole, and you are not prograde orbit, the supernova black hole and spinning, of course, looks like uh, it's uh, smaller. That's actually wrong. It's like uh, the last stable orbit is closer and closer to the supernova black hole. And if you are in retrograde orbit, it's the contrary. It looks like uh, it's bigger meaning that the last stable orbit is uh, far and far away from, uh, the, uh, from the black hole. Now, uh, what's uh, the impact of this on the rate? That's the question to ask. Now, uh, again, this is the, the same plot I was showing at, at the beginning. And uh, when you want to derive uh, the total number of event rates, it's just a matter of an upper limit in the integral. You are just integrating from here to the, to the, to the top uh, until you get so to this uh, critical uh, signature axis, which is uh, the conjunction of uh, the red line, given the threshold between dynamics and uh, general relativity, to the last stable orbit. That's the upper limit on the integral. And uh, the point is that, uh, of course, if you move uh, that critical limit a little bit to the top, you are winning, say, a factor of 10 in length, you are winning a factor of uh, 1,000 in volume. And, uh, well, that has an impact on the uh, kind of uh, event rates. So that uh, the number of event rates that you get for a Kerr black hole, as compared to a Schwarzschild black hole, comes uh, multiplied by uh, this function, which uh, can be derived. and uh, in principle, so if this, uh, uh, if this is uh, 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 an interesting number, you could be boosting the, the event rates. And that function, so how much it depends on the spin of the central object and inclination. And uh, that function looks like this and uh, has many dimensions. Uh, this is the spin, this is the uh, uh, this inclination and uh, the, uh, the function, but translated to rate, <coughs> so uh, how much do you win for a Kerr black hole as normalized uh, to the same uh, black hole but uh, non-spinning for a, a, a power law of 1.75, 1.5, here you get up to that kind of number. And uh, for shallower uh, cache, it's uh, looking more interesting. And uh, for a uh, isotopic core, you get uh, that kind of uh, increase. This is the, the uh, the ratio between Kerr and, uh, and uh, Schwarzschild. Now, uh, why, so this is, this is interesting. I don't have an absolute number to give you, so, so the event rate is going to be blah. And uh, I don't think that's uh, very interesting on the other hand. But uh, so uh, in any case, so again, you can create the sigma spherical spirals very far away or very close to the Schwarzschild black hole. But uh, when you get to, uh, distances below a hundredth of a parsec, you 
seem to have a problem, or may maybe not. And uh, in the because of this blockade in uh, Swedish space, so there is some debate ongoing. But uh, traditionally, so the the picture that uh, we got uh, from uh, the papers written about this is that uh, any source created there would have uh, a blockade in aqua momentum, so that it would not uh, get closer to uh, to the kind of uh, uh, orbit that you need to zoop, go to the gravitational wave uh, uh, region. <coughs> but in any case, so uh, being over there is a problem. And uh, if you want to get into the interesting region, you have to, uh, by using Dahl's words, you have to walk the few last meters by relying on super relaxation. And uh, the evolution in space, space of uh, this very uh, eccentric uh, symmetry that I've been talking about looks like that. This is the metro axis eccentricity between 0.5. I'm starting here actually quite close. <coughs> In gray, you have the spatial separatrix. So these things are really, uh, they're really uh, uh, making progress and getting closer and closer and closer to the center of the black hole by following very closely the spatial separatrix. And uh, this is a zoom in of the same picture. And uh, this is another case. I was starting here at three parsecs, the last uh, part of that. But uh, in any case, uh, so the question is, uh, this is interesting, but uh, the, the, the point is, are these real symmetries and spars? Are we, going to, are we going to get uh, many, many cycles? And uh, it looks like that. Again, this is the upper center in parsecs starting at uh, small distances, but uh, you get uh, uh, also quite a, uh, quite a lot of uh, cycles for, uh, di for distances which are higher than this one. So this is, by the way, this is the Lisa band, when the it enters in the, uh, the Decker band. And uh, so the conclusion are the following. So uh, super relaxation symmetry and spirals they originate at the bulk of the solar system where you have many, many uh, potential sources. And uh, they are very loud also because of the eccentricity, the initial eccentricity. And they accumulate up to tens and uh, for some cases, hundreds of uh, thousands of uh, cycles in the Lisabon. Uh, there was uh, this paper C with uh, the work of uh, Clift, but uh, he was using a different uh, approach. He was using a, a post entrainment, and uh, unless you have uh, probably proceeded a little bit, and uh, no, you are not very close to a super black hole, uh, that's not uh, very uh, probable, probably. And uh, contrary to resonant relaxation, symmetries, and spirals, uh, two body relaxation is a chaotic process, so uh, uh, it cannot. Uh, care about uh, blockades in Agulant Momentum. Um, they don't know anything about this spatial area. And uh, um, also look at uh, that plot before. So uh, the, the kind of estimation spirals that we are looking at uh, follow very closely this line here. So they really know nothing about that uh, area. So, um, yeah, they are both following very closely the spatrix. And uh, in principle, the event rates are higher than the spatrix, but given an absolute number, as uh, many have uh, asked, uh, seems to be a very difficult exercise. But in any case, I would say that uh, the conclusion is that uh, super relaxation is uh, the way of looking at uh, how to produce the symmetry of spatrix, so we're going back 